Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Wayward Festival and virtually to Aberdeen. Um, it's a great pleasure to have all these wonderful writers with us here this evening. Um, we have to thank Creative Scotland and the University of Aberdeen for very kindly funding this and Leopard Arts and pushing out the boat, of course, for supplying the writers. I'm going to hand you over to uh, the chairs for this evening, um, Will Creed and Lily Greenall, um, without further ado. So you have a lovely evening and thank you very much for coming. Well, yes, good evening, everybody, and welcome to, uh, as Helen said, the Wayward Festival uh, Writer Showcase, brought to you this evening by Leopard Arts and Pushing Out the Boat magazine. I'm Will Creed, um, co-editor of Leopard Arts, and I will be co-hosting this event alongside Lenny, Lily Greenall from Pushing Out the Boat. Uh, Lily, do you want to just introduce Pushing Out the Boat to anybody who is in the audience who might not know uh, what, they, what, what, what it's all about? Hiya, um, yeah, I'm Lily. I'm the editor of Pushing Out the Boat. Um, Pushing Out the Boat is a Northeast based uh, literary journal. And we publish biannually, we publish a selection of prose, poetry, and visual arts from um, artists and writers around the Northeast and also in the wider world. So we've got some readers from our catalog for you tonight. Yeah, um, and Leopard Arts is a multi-platform organisation for the promotion of artists and acts, specifically within, uh, well, and the arts, specifically within Aberdeen City and Shire. Um, and, you know, we publish poetry, prose, music, non-fiction pieces um, and visual arts um, uh, on our website, as well as putting on live events and online exhibitions. So, um, yeah, tonight we've got five acts uh, that have been, all been published on the Leopard Arts website in some form or another. Um, and yeah, but first, um, just sort of like, yeah, as I was saying, thank you to the sort of the tech team, uh, Leslie, uh, providing BSL, um, for us, uh, BSL support for us, and of course, Wayward Festival for putting this all on. We wouldn't, none of us would be here without uh, Wayward Festival. So, uh, without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first act. Um, the his poet, uh, his poetry focuses uh, more on. Um, sorry, hang, hang on a minute. Um, yeah, um, Jordan Stead uh, is a um, poet who's been published on Leopard Arts. I think from the beginning, uh, when we launched our um, website almost two years ago now, um, he focuses on um, the, the tumult of the emotional subject using mythological and religious iconography. Um, his poetry illustrates the passage of relationships and the complexities of sexuality in a way that is refreshingly candid. Take it away, Jordan. Cheers. Uh, thank you, Will. Um, so my first uh, poem is titled uh, Tarot, so here goes. October brings winds to the windowsill, the cold hands begging to be let in through the pain. I go inside myself, shivering under the blanket of old skin, peeling yellow and red feathers. I am ill with nostalgia, that roaring white rings the ears, waves of sickness envelope the body, shifting into glass. Full bright, the moon dances, beckoning change into the air. I shiver, hailing blood to the tips of my fingers, a spell in ecstasy, divine tongues and thrills. Candles bite at the skin as it knots and unfurls. I slice the moon open and observe the tendrils, hoping to find myself within. And my second poem, which was recently uh, published up on Leopard Arts, is uh, titled uh, Antigone which is based on uh, the Greek tragedy. Uh, so here goes. Um, here I am, that famed gravekeeper. From the soil I closed a body, the sameness felt from the womb, divided into two, half. Tragedy fell in the arms of a woman, Thebes held in two paper palms, thin as a drumskin. Ours was crushed by the boot heel. I stir and wake to find that body held by silt. Hanging on the bedsheet, pull them back and see the stains cling wet to cloth, doused in morning's burial shroud. What do the fates stir for me? I see the lines, a split thing too shining to die. What I bury is a madness of my own. 
So yeah, um, thanks to uh, Will and Edmund Liberty Darts for uh, having me on, and of course, uh, Wayward. So yeah, thanks, guys. And thank you, Jordan, uh, for performing those brilliant poems for us uh, this evening. Um, second up um, is, uh, well, shall I say a particular favourite of mine? Um, Andrew Collins's work um, is a lot more, well, I, not, I don't want to say down to earth, but more concrete than that of uh, uh, Jordan's. Um, he has the power to transform the... Uh, oh, Leslie, I'm sorry. The unsettling. I used to parade around in the copy on uh, on, on the Leopard Arts website uh, the term Shire Gothic uh, to describe Andrew's work because it often focuses on settings and themes that are bespoke to Aberdeenshire um, and uh, explores them through the paranoias, fears and fantasies of its various characters. Uh, often uh, to uh, unsettling and fearful conclusions. So welcome everybody, uh, Andrew Collins. Hello, um, thank you very much, Will. Um, this short story is called New Deer. It's about a, a country kirkyard. Claire McInnes didn't remember laying the flowers on the grave. They weren't there the last time she came up to the little cemetery on the hill above the village. That was only three days ago. She hadn't left them. His parents were down in Edinburgh, his brother in Australia. It was well past the point where friends would come and see him. So where had they come from? The unfamiliar presence on the grave had thrown her. She stood well back, seemingly afraid to approach too close, as if she was interrupting something. She searched the graveyard for an answer to this riddle, that save for the crows and the skeleton trees looming high above, she was completely alone. The air fresh from its flight across the fields to the north told of a coming snow, and silence reigned but for the laments of the birds. She was vacillating between more emotions than she could keep track of. One moment she felt she ought to turn and come another day, another she felt sick with anger that someone else had intruded on her morning. She could cry as easily as she could dash those flowers to bits on the hard ground. But what was provoking these feelings? Did flowers left by another on his grave really have to be suggestive of anything? Why had she jumped to such hurtful conclusions? She breathed deeply, letting the frigid air into her lungs, momentarily numbing her cares. She took a, top, a couple of steps forward and noted the flowers. They were your typical supermarket fair. Did that have to mean anything? They lay carefully on their sides, diagonally across the grave. His simple stone, standing forlorn above, spoke of a life cut cruelly premature, spoke of a man so dear to a mother, father, brother, and wife. Now who was encroaching on this? She reproached herself for being selfish in grief. She didn't have, an, she didn't have a monopoly on his mourning, for he was a good man, um, much beloved by friends and colleagues. Why couldn't she allow for this? Did it not say so much more about her own self-esteem that this unexpected sight was challenging something in her? The sight of the flowers was becoming more and more egregious to her. She felt incensed by the sight of carnations. She wished to trample the roses into the spiteful earth. She checked herself. She was clearly overreacting. She gazed down towards the village, seeing the languid plumes of smoke from the chimneys. She could smell the peat that was so redolent at this time of year. Suddenly. It was as if someone had pricked her heart or her conscience. She felt as if she could cry again, but not for herself, but for this poor soul who'd gone to a supermarket, picked out an eye-catching bunch of flowers, paid for them, remembered to remove the price sticker, traveled to this hushed place and lain them on the grave of someone who clearly meant something to them. There was something so precious in all this, and she, this brute of a woman, had wanted to destroy this token of someone's loss someone trying to find whatever peace there was to be had in this sorry state of things. She wanted to know who this was, who had cared for her husband, who had took the time to let him know that wherever he was, that he wasn't forgotten. She wanted to commiserate with this kindly stranger. She wanted to wrap her arms around him and weep for him, for them, and for herself. She crouched down and doing so caught the first faint zephyrs of fragrance. 
It was a scent that entered and coiled around her comfort. She felt at peace. She felt connected to someone, to a nature that grew such beautiful, elegant expressions of emotion. She saw a little envelope, feeling as if on the side of a door to a place that she could find resolve or greater pain. She hesitated. Was this a line? Was this definitely an intrusion into the heart of another? Did the mere fact it was her husband in the earth below permit her to look, to see what another offered to console, to balm? She could feel the turbulence of her bile shaking something in her. Those precious feelings were now cloying. She began to resent again, to question, to feel an entitlement. She quickly snatched the envelope for fear her peak was about to throw the bouquet over the wall into the empty lane behind. With some care, she removed the card from inside. The sound both soothed and rankled. Its outside cover had a simple picture of some pink roses. She tried desperately to reclaim that empathy she had before. She felt this rancor to be most unattractive, but it was difficult. She was afraid she was about to find something crushing inside, clearing her throat as if she was to project aloud the contents. She opened the card. It read simply, Jenkuya. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Andrew. It's uh, uh, always great to uh, hear your stuff performed. Well, I've not actually heard it performed before, but really good to hear it performed. Um, next up uh, is a particular performer who means a lot to us um, here at Leopard Arts. Um, Tom Bymshaw joined our editorial team um, about a year ago now. Um, and has been able Almost to bring exactly, yeah. um, so much, uh, not least his creative talent, which often features elements of the natural world bursting through the cracks of everyday life. Fascinated by science fiction, weird horror and pelagic patter, Tom's work <laughs> is ever eerie, rich and poignant in equal measure. Tom, by I'm sure everyone. Thank you. Pelagic patter, I, I love that. Um, I am going to... Uh... I'm going to read two very short stories and I'm not sure if I'll fill up the entire time, but it's two short stories which I wrote for the Occult and Avant-Garde Society back in 2018. And I rediscovered them quite recently. Uh, and they're kind of particular to Aberdeen, which is why I, I felt I wanted to read them here. So this is the first one and it's called Food Story. There's a secret menu at Food Story. It's a bold new move for the company a realization of what's promised by the name. In an historic move for the organization, this menu is based entirely on flesh, crab, fox, frog, trout, or something else if you're lucky. They tried this concept adhering to their vegan principles, but narrative is hard to communicate in vegetable. The words fail to form or ad abstract themselves into shapes impossible to translate. Only in the wet rip the tug of sinews breaking and muscles unknitting, can you get a narrative you can understand. When you chew the meat, which is served unseasoned and raw, the words burst on your tongue. You start to speak in the pre-mammalian languages, understanding every word. You recite the trauma poetries of seagull, of badgers, the interpretative dance of bees, the punk performance of seagulls, the metamodern swagger of pigeon prosists. For those queasy about consuming animals, don't worry. Every item volunteers for the plate. Art's a fucking battlefield these days. People will do anything to get out of themselves. People will do anything to have their voices heard. That's Food Story. Uh, and I think the second one is just called, it, it wasn't titled, but I'm going to call it Change. Do you feel it? The city's changing. They said that art was the new oil. Art is the new oil. We woke up one day to find it smeared on our wall, walls and spoken word in our pubs and poetry zines in our kitchens. Can you feel it? The city's changing, the world is. We all have to get used to it. When a mass extinction event occurs, adaptive radiation ensures that every ecological niche is occupied. In this new ecosystem, here are the roles that you can fill. The poets rip open their insides and describe their rib cages, the scars beneath their skin. The musicians project into stars, splitting their souls and shivering in sound waves. 
the artists splay over the over walls, their blood spit and excrement staining granite. There are no room for any others. We're full to the gills. It's dog eat dog here. No room for the poor. You need fancy scarves to survive in this town now. No room for trauma unexpressed. No room for the old chip shops. Can you feel it? No room for the sad or shy. No room for the young or old. Can you fucking feel it? No room for you. The city's changing and we don't have room for you. We woke up one day to find art smeared on the walls. At night, it wakes up. I saw a fox the size of a building, a twitching form in its arms. It bit, crunched, before retreating back into its mural. We have ways of getting rid of people that we don't have room for. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. No, of course. Thank you, Tom. Those are two stories that I hadn't actually heard before uh, from Tom, um, and uh, yeah, um, some of the some of the best ones that I have heard from him. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Our fourth performer tonight also writes um, poetry, which is expressive and experimental. Um, with uh, previous publications being written in the, previous publications on leopard arts uh, being written in the form of Sir Duncan Rice Library and featuring uh, the seasons themselves intermingling with the emotional life of uh, a person or vice versa. Uh, you may have caught her in the recent World Dream Anthology, uh, which uh, had its launch event last month in Aberdeen. Uh, it's an and DJ Lukestina. Hello everyone, um, and thank you very much to Leopard Arts for having me in this writer showcase. Um, so the poem that I'm going to be reading is called She Paints the World on Her Mother's Back. The eyes of lions and bulls glow like smooth polished stones. There is spark in them, strength in their limbs like they are what spins the earth with their running. Waves of them run across the earth. The sight of them leaves her breathless. The world is full of reverb. Deer run and die like kings long before kings. She stains her hands with the heavy waves of their silhouettes, leaves the geometry of their crown horns on solid rock, and the lionesses watch with human-shaped jaws and something motherly in their eyes. The flesh is they honor. The flesh of beasts and sometimes humans. The red down their chins makes rivers like the ones on her palm. She honors her flesh and drinks the juice. She is respected by her people for her dancing and seeing. Her torch is big, bigger than the sun. She is conqueror of the world. She is so large and so small. The earth spins and spins in a newer cosmos, an earth that still has all its hair, but is old enough to have held her mother and not hold her anymore. In a woodland path where the air is made music with unending birds in dark and light, a handprint is left on a rock, which the rain washes away in time that only becomes time later. Glistening pulpy rivers on an open palm it is the indigo hour, and her mother's back is warm as she presses herself against it. The glowing ember leaves stars behind the veil of their sleep. Her mother's belly and the curve of the pristine universe overhead and her breath are so big. A mother is a rock. A mother's breath is so big. She wears practical furs, but not when she is chasing after the reverbs of the mammoths in their breathtaking volumes that run forever in torchlight and do not trample a thing. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andesia. That was another poem that I've not heard before, but uh, I love everything that she uh, comes out with. So brilliant. Thank you for that, Andesia. Um, dare I say that we've left uh, left the best till last? Um, our final performer is a veteran publisher and performer of poetry and prose, featured in magazines and journals the world over, um, and is a member of the vibrant Stonehaven-based um, collective Marin's Writers. 
Mark Arifa appeared in our uh, showcase back in August at the Blue Lamp and she blew everyone's bloody socks off. So take us home, Marka. Thank you very much, Phil. Well, no pressure then. Um, I'd like to start with uh, a poem which was in the Mearns Writers anthology, Shorelines. And this is, it was summer yesterday. It was summer yesterday, swings full, seafront thronged, queues dense for chips and ice cream, gulls gathered for the feast. Rabbits panted on the putting green, sandals clicked on the shingle, children and swifts screamed with delight. Today, it's a downpour, a crow hunched and scunnered on the esplanade. Rain rolls off his gothic claws, but the red on my cheek is the kiss of yesterday's summer. And now a short story of revenge, which will be published shortly. It's called Pearl in the Dust. Pearl watched the twisters dance around the plain. A two mule plow couldn't shift her bones. Let the spindles of ochre dirt do all the rejoicing. Ebb was dead. Three words to cover the months of whispered patient planning with Aaron and James, her young cousins, while Ebb slept. Then the way it happened and how long it took. It was supposed to be quick, like killing an old jack rabbit with a rock, but Ebb was some Bible beast when it came to it, roaring, howling fury. Looking at the plain lulled her thoughts. The fields had long gone, the green crops sickened, the shoots yellowed, turned paper dry and blew away. When they had seen, Ebb was beyond fighting for his sorry life, brought to ground by Pearl and the wood axe. The cousins continued to pummel their captor with their bony boy fists. Then they ran around the farmhouse, throwing onto the splintered boards what they didn't want to steal. Aaron, Ebb's blood, stiff in his hair, launched a plate spinning into a window. Glass and china shattered, and that set the pair on busting every pane. Shrieking, they broke down the locked larder door. They ate as they stood, silently packing ham and peaches into their split lip mouths. When the boys had dwindled to grey specks in the swirling dust, the axe finally fell from her thin fingers and Pearl managed four steps to sit in the empty window frame. And finally, I'm not one for binge watching, but during lockdown, one of my solaces was Mad Men. This is box set bliss. I go to Manhattan, old fashioned in hand, to hang out with Don and Megan, Roger and Joni, Betty and Peggy and Pete, where smoke gets in your eyes and everywhere else, where women are Virginia Slim or Firestone pneumatic, where you lounge at leisure in exquisite apartments, where every deal is a devious deal, sealed with a scotch. Soaking in the murky morals, the tank-sized typewriters, brill-creamed locks, manly chest hair, silk ties and pennants, ink pens and crimson talons, diving into the warm pool of casual misanthropy where the right three words are the lucky strike of dollars and power. Where a fall from grace may be a good move, willfully propelling these beguiling plot lines. Beyond my window, the world is gray, coronavirus quiet. So I'll stay here with these mad men and fabulous women. I may never come out. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. That was uh, brilliant. Magic as always. Uh, really, really love uh, everything I hear from uh, Marco. So thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, the Leopard Art section of this evening's event. Um, I'm going to hand over now to uh, Lily, who's going to uh, take all of you through what I imagine will be an equally spectacular um, showcase of uh, work from pushing out the boat. So uh, take it away, Lily. 
Hi, thank you very much, Will. Um, that was fantastic to hear um, all the leopard arts work there. It's always great to hear some new stuff and there's just so much talent uh, abounding in the poets that you get on. Um, so I, as I said earlier, we are a Northeast based uh, literary magazine and we publish a mixture of poetry, prose and visual arts. Uh, this was our most recent issue, issue 16, which was published uh, back in May of this year. Um, and this issue is uh, still on sale on our website and it is also um, available at Blackwell's Bookshop in Old Aberdeen. Um, all of the readers that we have tonight have all, they were all published in issue 16. Um, so it's a nice sample of uh, the types of works that we have in there. So I'll start by introducing our first reader, um, Gabrielle Barnby. Gabrielle Barnby lives in Orkney and writes short stories, poetry and full length fiction. Um, she has several books published and her writing has been included in anthologies and magazines. She's run creative writing workshops with participants uh, ranging from eight to 80. And she has a particular interest in writing for well-being. Um, at the moment, Gabrielle is working on a project to celebrate George Mackay Brown's centenary in Orkney. Um, so uh, welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you, Lily. Hopefully I'm going to appear in just a moment. Um, Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Leslie, I must apologize to you because there is a word here that might be tricky, uh, phototropic. Okay, all right. I've got three poems I'd like to read for you all this evening. This first one, uh, I wrote just as things were opening up after um, restrictions lifted a little. It's called Instructions for Opening. Another year begun watching the ocean where the ice is melting. Search for brightness, become phototropic, grow towards light. Work against the thought that this act is too simple to be good and worthwhile. Feel the deep physical flowering of change and follow the bright dream with courage. Lay the golden seed. Make the loudest and most joyful sounds and say, I am alive and open as a book. Be read with the torrent of life, with the fierce joy of being in this moment, now. I think we all needed a bit of instructions for opening after being at home for so long. Now, in honor of the waywards being in Aberdeen, I have a small poem here I wrote as I took the ferry from Orkney down to Aberdeen. It's called Sucked Thin by the Sea. A midge on the hide of rolling, rippling skin. Live animals in the hold. Perishable goods. Smell of diesel and buyer. Sound of metal and flesh. I have abattoir thoughts and strain to keep sight of land. Messages arrived ping to someone from somewhere. It means we're still in signal range until even this, like the land, is sucked thin by the sea. I respect the ocean, refusing to be contained, to be always liminal. It terrifies me. And finally, another wee poem about new beginnings. It's the start of term for many people. 
And uh, for many people, sending their young ones, as I've sent my daughter off to university, it's a time of new beginnings. So this one is called On Beginning, and it is as raw as uh, State Tartar. I wrote it uh, on Monday. On Beginning. It is possible to make a new start. This morning, every step has potential. Each is a chance to stop or go on, to accept the process of beginning and in that moment to move forward in all the middles and endings that have become hard, to remember a sense of change. Skin touched by sun welcomes the brightness and soft relief. It is possible to make a new start. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your lovely work. Thank you very much for that, Gabrielle. That was uh, lovely to hear some new stuff from you as well. Um, so our next reader is Mark Cassidy. Uh, Mark is a Burmese by birth and grew up on the Isle of Wight. He's written poems for as long as he can remember. And these poems have appeared in journals like Northwoods Now, Poetry Salzburg Review and Skylight 47. Um, his four watchwords in his poetry are economy, strength, tough, toughness and wit. So welcome, Mark. Just wait, I might see myself. Uh... Hi. Um... I can't, can, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, we're okay. We're good to go. Okay. Um, so uh, it's always a joy to uh, to be in pushing out the boat, um, especially as a Sassanac. Uh, uh, always the attention to the quality of the production and, and so confident in its own voice. So always a pleasure. I'm going to read, first of all, I've got three poems. And the first one I want to read is from the recent publication in May. It's kind of a climate poem, although it wasn't intended that way. Uh, if you go to a Russian fishing village on the White Sea, uh, this is kind of what might be happening to you. Uh, it's called Against the Grain. How sand piles up here at my door. Strong winds carry countless skipjack granules bouncing like beach balls from the shore. Checked by picket fences, yet marching still, there is no way to hold it back. Reaching through keyholes, it creeps over sill, then once inside spreads everywhere, infiltrates the floorboard gaps, drowns the joists, skin scratching smothers my armchair. It mounts and mounts, recasts really staircase as June, gets swept in corners, swallows light. Sand blind, its inert mouth becomes cocoon. Should Bell be buried by this grit, guests are warned, bring spade. Mine waits in the hall, soon I must dig my own exit. So that was pretty bleak. Um, uh, the next poem I'd like to read was uh, inspired by um, uh, Scott Hutchinson, who was a very talented uh, uh, songwriter with the indie band Frightened Rabbit. And I saw them about six months before he rather tragically, uh, very tragically, uh, took his own life. It's not really a poem about that. It was inspired by the kind of things that he was saying in his songs. And it's called Testing the Water. Testing the Water. A flow we seek to capture, bridge or channel, yet cannot confine. Lithe as mercury, slipping fingers, it is held in brush-stroked cloud and then let fall 
rattling on rooftops. Pools, unstirred, collect the tension of drip, drip droplets, mirror flat, refract our point of view, reveal all kinds of surface. Of running water, folklore says that no enchantment can survive it. To know the end you go to, be the stream, not a stick that's spun at source. Ride the impulsive rapids to middle age meandering, no cataracts in sight. At the delta of days, silk laden, reach the surf, then fathomless beyond, swim until you see no land. Uh, I guess that kind of fixes me as a veteran rather than an emerging writer. Uh, although I did ask my friends, they said I was an emerging veteran. Um, the last thing I'd like to read um, is a poem that came out of uh, my son broke up with his, his girlfriend. He hadn't seen it coming and it, it was a huge shock to him and he was in complete emotional disruption. And so he was going to come home and spend some time with us. And so he wanted to uh, do up uh, his room, the spare room in, in the house. So this, uh, uh, this is just a poem about uh, redecorating his room. Uh, it's called uh, Jazzing Up the Empire Suite. Uh, and if you want to read any other things into it, that's entirely up to you. Uh, it comes from this kind of rather nice handbook for 2021, just a quick plug for Culture Matters, a, a really good website you can go to, and they were very kind enough to put this one in, 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 their, uh, in their compilation for this year. So this is Jazzing Up the Empire Suite. You might need me glasses for this one. We are painting over your past today, with sweeping statements hide its pockmarked face. The paper scoured for loopholes, rips and flaws, we felt for cracks and polyfiller plugged them. Then sanded smooth the seams to barely notice. So thinking all's wiped clean, we're primed to start but first must argue out which tone will turn the smear of bilious pink to sunlit room, a place where you may set yourself apart. The favoured pigment spreads, blots out betrayal, for truth gets brushed in corners, hard to reach those angles overhead and at our feet. Our sights are set on coverage, wall to wall, no underbubble or peeling edges, yet this is a rush to judgment job. You will choose the gloss, add final touches later. That's it, that's all from me. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really enjoying all the voices we're hearing tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Mark. Um, some great poems there. Um, so our next reader is Nicola Fury Murphy. Um, Nicola Fury Murphy was born in Aberdeen and lives rurally near Stonehaven. Um, she is thrilled to have been published in Pushing Out the Boat and also in Leopard Art. Um, she writes poetry in English and in Doric with a wee bitty help and is currently working on a nature slash life writing novel. So uh, welcome Nicola. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my first piece tonight was published in Pushing Out the Boat, and I was just so thrilled. I was sitting watching Strictly Come Dancing when um, the good news came through that the submission had been accepted. So now whenever I hear Pushing Out the Boat, I always um, associate it with the theme tune for the fanfare of the show. Okay. Um, here we have Passing Place. We were together when you spotted the dead badger, lying on the verge, snout down towards the valley. The heft of a stately body, black oily coat flecked by sludge and snow. Bare silver birches lined the sim single track road. We walked on 
in silence. Days later, over drinks, you brought up Brock. Yes, it was me, said a neighbour, who pulled him from the road. Surprised, you asked for details. It was dark and I wore gloves, she offered practically. We nodded respectfully, me never imagining that what the badger had could be catching. A year on, I looked out from the upstairs window at the place where you too took your last breath, so close to your set. Jet locks, mossy eyes, lashes frosted. I never heard you howl as I sat, liminal light, waiting. On the second anniversary, a stone's throw away, a red cone marks the spot. Across the hills, pylons pulse as, high, as workers in high-vis vests descend to break ground. It's a thin line, thin enough to raise an ironic smile. Hoisted aloft in black caps, a sign passing place. Okay, now uh, for a change in tempo. Uh, this is um, something that I wrote that's fun, uh, based on my experiences this summer in the Stonehaven open air pool. And I'm also a member of the uh, Merns Writers. So I want to thank everybody there that helps me along with my Doric, because you, as you'll tell, I'm not a natural Doric speaker. Okay, this one's called Too Busy Dancing. It was my choice to gang doon the shoot. The in at the open air pool. The yalla moo gaupit. Come awa. You're near bare new, ye all feel. Twas our final aqua zumba fling. Ah, the ravers hid flowers in their hair, winking and twerking with the lifeguard loons. Back in, ah, the life moves. Fit rare. Scurls, oh, Jonah, can you handle this? Splashes, oh, deco, deco turquoise. Where are destiny's chills new? Shack your money macker, feel the noise. I was not a lean, other wifeys lined up, and are the michty steps. Shimmies, ah, shapes and sizes o' oh, doubt, scaling the mighty stairway in rip pearl jimmies. The skilfi afore me, bare shot doon, gain our hidi a clattering dunt. She slip it richt anise the water and fleg it abedy, exeunt. But up, she bob it, just waving, nae droonin, black affronted. My shotty on the shoot, water trickled doon, still shakin, I thought I micht chicken oot. Was it choice to hurl myself forward? Or was it fear, O oh, freezing fast? Plunged and purged, we emerged gaping. Trick it, summer selkies at last. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for that, Nicola. Um, love that image of the summer selkies, that's lovely. Um, so, our next reader is. Um, Max Scratchman. Um, Max is the crazed genius behind Poetry Circus, uh, the Edinburgh-based spoken word theatre company, and he is also an illustrator, writer and performer in his own right. So great to have Max here with us tonight. Hello everyone. Um, sorry, I had to rig up this kind of impromptu microphone because I couldn't get connected to Zoom. But anyway, it's the, we'll make the best of all. Okay, I'm going to do uh, two poems for you tonight. Uh, the first one 
is one that was published in Pushing Out the Boat, and the other one is just a favourite of mine. So this is The Gaelic Teacher and the Dinner Lady. To the world, they seem an odd pair. The Gaelic Teacher and the Dinner Lady, one in her sensible tweeds and brogues, the other pearlescent in unrepentantly fluorescent swathes of dry nylon. But the Gaelic teacher tastes of dry, musty tomes and the undulating heather on purple hillsides. Her skin is imbued with the mod songs of long dead markers, and epic poems adorn all the downy hair of her arms and legs, so that with a lover's touch you can read her like braille. The dinner lady, though, has a form of education. But when she embraces the Gaelic teacher, the literature of a whole nation peels off and adheres itself to her skin as her lover inhales all the homely scents of her own plum pudding body. And to the Gaelic teacher, the dinner lady is an almanac of sensual delights, a grandmother's kitchen worth of fond memory of old cheese pie cuddles and boiled cabbage struggles. And the Gaelic teacher has hungered for someone like this all her life. Her kisses are cherry pie, her caresses jam roly poly and curd comes like a sherbet found on the teacher's tongue. And so they live together in a saucy contentment, their very own book-lined gingerbread cottage overflowing with love, each getting more than enough to cherish until well past bedtime and the silent doubts of the wee small hours. Thank you. And this one is called Football Songs. So it's New Year's Day and I'm 17 at a football match with my dad. And it's freezing cold and I am bored witless and asking myself just why I'm here. Well, because it's tradition, because it's what fathers and sons go on January the 1st, because my dad waited 10 years to have a son and then he got me. Because he taught me how to ride my bike and we built a model railway together and there's this ruddy great chasm between this like a huge maw. And at least I can meet the poor man halfway. And it's not that he doesn't try to get on my wavelength. We went to the cinema together, but it was clockwork orange and he cringed with embarrassment at all the nude scenes. And the theatre, oh dear, the theatre was worse when he snored right through Hedda Gabler and then he mortified me by saying, what was that, that bloody rubbish about in the direct hearing? And really, what the hell am I doing here? Because I am never going to understand what offside is, no matter how many times you explain it to me. And I adore you, but I want the Finnish reading catcher in their eye or be watching that Bergman film that's on BBC Two this afternoon. Not standing here, freezing my bollocks off in this ruddy terrace. And yeah, I've got my cues off pat by now, and I only cheer when the men in the blue scarves cheer. But... It's a load of men kicking a ball between two sticks, for fuck's sake. How much more is there to say about it? And I know it's only once a year. And I know I owe you that much. But the years have flown by and you've gone. And I'd give anything to be standing on that reason with you one more time. Thank you. Thanks very much, Max. Um, that was really, really great. Um, so our final reader for this evening is E.E. Uh, e. Chandler. E.E. Um, e. Chandler lives a busy life in the northeast of Scotland. She finds it hard to find time to write, but knows that she must. And her favorite themes to write about include travel and relationships. So I'll... Uh, Welcome, E.E. Chandler. Thank you, Lily. Um, my computer just crashed, so I'm joining you on my mobile phone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, so thank you to Leslie, first of all. Um, thank you for Leslie, first of all, for translating for me. There's something really poetic about the translation itself. Um, and secondly, uh, thanks to Pushing Out the Book for inviting me. So my first poem tonight is a travel poem. It's called Corsica. The waitress has a light bulb tattooed on her inner arm containing a forest, the moon, and the single word solas. 
It's the light I love, she explains, talking of this place they call the land of smiles, where breathing in the breakfast oven's wood smoke, we eat as advised without moderation, little cats clustering below tables sleek and cared for. Small villages perch precariously on hills, all spires and terracotta roofs. We wander the steep streets of Piña, where coloured doves call out from wrought iron balconies. Not another soul in sight, but clinking cutlery and thin voices feathered through the afternoon air, betraying the presence of others. Later, in our sheltered world, cocktails coloured by the island, honey, hibiscus, mint and lemon. The early evening's warm wind across the mouth of a bottle mimics a Corsican quartet, sings its song of the sky, accompanied by the harbour's ringing masts. But at night, the sky is striped with violent lightning, mountaintops lit black silhouettes like jagged teeth in an old man's jaw, union cost stickers on roadside posts, hard bandit stairs in a local bar where boars' heads are pinned to walls as warnings. And on a street corner, a beggar's grateful smile is enough to fracture the heart. I'll warn you now that my second poem <clears throat> on the familiar theme for me of failed relationships contains some sexual content, but it is nearly 9 p.m. Oath Law. It is late at night and we're driving home in silence after another weekend away. Through the passenger window I watch the ink blue sky, passing purple hills, white fields. Trapped together the hours pass and proximity leads to desire, brings about a closeness. When you pull off the side of the dark road into a gap in the woods, we undress without words. You reach for me, as if to an extended lifeline, climb across with awkward urgency. I plant bare feet against the cold windscreen, open myself to you, wish for these minutes to save us. Outside, the snow falls in feathered flakes, lit up by the headlights like small dying birds. And the last poem is the poem which appeared in the latest edition of Pushing Out the Boat. Um, and it's, uh, it means a lot to me. My mum died last year, so it's, it's really nice to have this tribute to her in Pushing Out the Boat. It's called Washing My Mother's Hair. My mother in her wheelchair leans over the apricot sink. I am washing her hair, handling her gently, neck and spine so thin she might otherwise snap. I examine her fragility, note how I might look in 40 years time. Age has shrunk in her, a little grey bird, shoulder blades jutting like budding wings. Conversation is difficult now that she can't hear and can't find the words, but she talks anyway. And though she doesn't make sense, I still hear her meaning. My fingers, white with foam, shield her eyes, massage her scalp, shampoo the long fine strands. I consider how it used to be when I was the child in the bath and she was washing my hair. And so, cupping my mother's head in my hands, I make the most of close now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Some really lovely moving poetry there and nice to hear some of your other stuff as well that wasn't from pushing out the boat. Um, so that concludes um, all of our readings for this evening. Um, I'd like to thank all of our readers and all the readers from Leopard's Arts um, so much for uh, sharing their work with us. It's just just brilliant to hear um, everybody's stuff. Um, so there is a, oh, I'd also like to obviously say a thank you to the Wayward team for organizing this event as well. Um, 
and there is a, a Q and A session now. Um, in if you want to ask questions in the chat uh, to me or to Will or to any of the readers, um, we will be here to do that. Hello, everyone. Sorry, we've lost Will somewhere, and um, we're going to have a Q and A. Um, so you can ask the authors or you can ask anyone from Leopard Arts or from Fishing Out the Boat about their work. Um, so yeah, if you pop your questions, there's a, there's a Q&A button at the bottom with two little speech bubbles. You pop them in there instead of the chat, now we can keep track of them a little bit easier. But we already have a question, which is where can I get the list of the authors forward slash readers? And is it possible to watch these sessions later? So I can answer like two thirds of that question. So uh, after that last question first, um, the session is being recorded, but we don't have any plans to release it. We would have to talk to all the speakers about whether they would like to release it. And that would take a few weeks. So, so we don't know yet if we will be able to share that with you. But the good news is, is you, you can find a lot of the writers um, if you're looking for any of the uh, readers for Leopard Arts, if you go to leopardarts.co.uk, and I'll try and remember to put this in the chat for you, um, you can find all of the readers except for Marta. You can find them all on leopardarts.co.uk, but you can find Marta um, at Mearns Writers. Um, Lily, I can see you there. Um, would you like to tell people where they can find... Um, Pushing out the boat, re readers. Um, yes, all of um, the readers' work is accessible on um, our website, pushingoutheboat.co.uk, uh, um, and you can you can access the problem the poems that are published in Pushing Out the Boat that the readers read tonight, um, and um, you should also be able to find some links to um, some other places where they've got work published on the Pushing Out the Boat. Uh, through the Pushing Out the Boat website. Thank you. Um, we've got another question. So we've got lots of good feedback, but somebody is asking, Max changed some of the words in Gaelic Teacher from the published version. Was that performative spontaneity or is it an evolving piece? Max, if you're there, if you want to pop on and answer that. Oh, I think we've lost Max. I can't see on my screen. Can anyone else see? No, I think <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. Sorry, uh, Roger. We will have to see if we can track Max down and ask again. Um, yes. Um, has anyone else got any further questions? If you just pop them in. Oh, so. Um, there's a few, if you look into the chat, um, Naomi from uh, Leopard Arts has been putting in the read, the order of all the readers who spoke, so you can look them up further, and Gabrielle has included a link to her website as well if you want to track down more of her work. Oh, we haven't got any questions and everyone's just in stunned silence at the moment. Will, have you got anything to say? Um, no, I've, got, I've maybe got a question for Lily, actually. Um, you mentioned that uh, the uh, that Pushing Out the Boat's gone biennial recently. Um, like, it's formally now, it's kind of, um, uh, is it every other year that you're publishing? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, where, where can we pick those up? Where can we, where can we get those? Um, you can get Pushing Out the Boat. I, I think it has always been every other year. Uh, not 100% sure about way back, but I, I think that is the case. Um, but you, you can order them online through the website um, and you can also pick them up. Uh, there's a variety of um, bookshops in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. Um, the one I know there are copies in is the Blackwell's Bookshop in Old Aberdeen. Um, but there's a there's a variety of places in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire as well. We've got another question in, which is um, how can people submit to these magazines or slash website? How do they get in touch with you? So Lily, if you want to answer first. 
Um, well, pushing out the boat, because we published an issue in May, we won't be taking submissions now for, um, I think it'll be um, next year, I guess, we'll be, we'll be starting to ask for submissions. Um, we will put out calls to submissions and then you can, um, you can submit through the website. There'll be um, an info email address that you can send submissions to. Um, but I think that will be starting um, next year, maybe uh, kind of early, like late spring, summertime next year. And Will? Oh, right, sorry, I, I couldn't unmute there for a second. Um, no, uh, submissions are always open for Leopard Arts. Um, the only prerequisite being that you have to live or have a strong connection with Aberdeen City or Shire. Um, and you can submit um, any kind of creative material or non-fiction material relating to um, the arts and uh, and uh, the creative world, cultural world um, at uh, admin at leopardarts.co.uk. Uh, send us something through um, and we'll have a look at it and we can uh, get it up on the website uh, sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's it. Uh, the, no, actually no. There's a full there's a full kind of breakdown of the parameters for everything. Um, you know, we're we're not just going to take like a single haiku and 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 give it its own page. Uh, but you can see uh, the the whole kind of breakdown for all the parameters uh, at www.leopardarts.co.uk forward slash submissions um, as well for anybody interested. And you've also mentioned, well, someone's asking that you mentioned events. When is your next one? Uh, so um, we've got our next planned event is due to take place, I believe, on the 26th of October um, at the Blue Lamp. Uh, it's a um, it's the second year of our uh, Sawain uh, Halloween themed uh, online exhibition and the event is uh, will be themed to go along with it, showcasing some of the performance and some of the work that we've uh, had uh, that, that will be published in that uh, exhibition. Um, I think everybody, anybody who's interested in that, either attending or potentially performing, um, should uh, Get, get involved with our social medias, give us a like, give us a follow. That announcement will be coming in the next few days. So for the people that are here in the audience, you get a little sneak preview of that. Um, and uh, yeah, as well with all the all the kind of like uh, further details, any, any sort of uh, screws that need to be tightened on that as well. So um, yeah, check us out. Thank you, Will. Um, there's a whole conversation happening in the chat. Um, so Gabrielle asks, Nicola, do you write in Doric or Standard English most? And does what you write differ depending on the language? And then Nicola replied, um, saying, I was very tentative about writing in Doric. It's very much dependent on the topic. I've written a few Doric pieces on sheep. Like Henry Moore, I watch sheep from my window. So then we've got some questions. So Lily. Where does the name Pushing Out the Boat come from? Um, well, Pushing Out the Boat has, it's been active for quite a long time in Aberdeen. I believe the name originates from, um, I think it was to do with making nautical puns and uh, it kind of came about that way. There was a, an anecdote, but I'm afraid I can't remember exactly what it was um so i think it's um something i would have to check with a a longer standing member of pushing out the boat to find out no worries the hidden lore of pushing out the boat. <laughs> that's an interesting one um someone has actually asked for an encore they would like to hear jordan stead read again jordan if you are up for that. Will is clapping. If you'd like to do that, you can just pop on your camera. Um, or if you'd like to warm up, I can ask one or two more questions. Oh, you're there. Go for it. Um, <laughs> um, I can read like one of the ones I read tonight again, if that's what people want. <laughs> you have a guess? Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's what people are asking for. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll read Taro again because that's my favourite, I guess. So. <laughs> Um, so, Taro. October brings wings to the windowsill, the cold hands begging to be let in through the pane. I go inside myself, 
shivering under the blanket of old skin, peeling yellow and red and red, feathers wilting. I am ill with nostalgia, that roaring white rings the ears, waves of sickness envelop the body, shifting into glass. Full bright, the moon dances, beckoning change in the air. I shiver, hailing blood to the tips of my fingers, a spell in ecstasy, divine tongue in thrills, candles bite at the skin as it knots and unfurls. I slice the moon open and observe the tendrils, hoping to find myself within. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that again, Jordan. Thank you, Jordan. So very, always good to hear it again. Right. Um, I'm going to ask Lily and Will to do me a favor. Uh, someone's asking for links for your websites and socials. Could you both copy and paste them into the chat and send to everyone? Um, just so that everyone can track you down a little bit easier um, for me, please. Cheers, Min Jordan. That's from Pamela. Um, do, do, uh, Lily, the Pushing Out the Boat writers, are they based in Aberdeen only? No, they're not. We take submissions from uh, all over the place, just internationally. Um, so you don't have to feel like uh, you can only submit if you're connected to the Northeast in some way. Uh, but we do, we get a lot of uh, Northeast writers submitting, so it, it creates a, a good variety. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I've put the links down for the website and our Facebook and our Instagram down there as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, and someone's asking about Leopard Arts. How did how did Leopard Arts start, basically? How was it founded? Um, Leopard Arts, right, okay. So gather around, children. Um, so the Leopard Arts began uh, as part of a, um, essentially, I believe it was a, a just an idle conversation uh, between me and uh, somebody else who used to be around on the literature scene in Aberdeen um, when she studied here. Um, called uh, NG Mandia, um, who some people, a name that some people might recognize. Um, and we initially had the idea of a uh, venue in Aberdeen uh, that, only, um, that only put on kind of like local acts, either bands or literary performances, that kind of thing, uh, that, you know, we would be able to kind of like um, give that as a, as a place to promote those artists and uh, to really sort of you know have a home for it all and then we kind of realized that we didn't have any money and so we sort of put it to one side for uh, a couple of months and after a while there was an idea for a website could we put together a website that would act as a as a single umbrella to try and connect all the dots of the uh, various different disparate Aberdeen scenes because I think there's there's a general awareness I think in Aberdeen so say for example you're in the literature scene you know you know what speaking weird is you know what pushing out the boat is you know what uh, wayward festival is right um, but you might not necessarily be aware of all the other good things you might not know where to find the best music you might not uh, know like who the best sort of bands are that are out there that are operating in Aberdeen just now you might not know other than the art gallery, where to go and find uh, great visual art from great local visual artists. And, and it's all out there, it's all happening. Um, but I found that, you know, particularly my experience as a student, you know, coming through the literature scene, uh, even though I had friends in, in these other scenes, it was, it was hard to get information out. One thing that Aberdeen, I feel, has got like a real problem with is, communications in between these different kind of institutions is generally poor uh, especially amongst like the music scene and that so um that would that was that, that was sort of the big thing like right we're gonna come in we're gonna get everybody together and we're gonna hopefully try and set up some cross-pollination between these different uh artistic groups and movements as well um and so it was july 2019 I want to say, yeah, July 2019, that we uh, eventually started putting the website together and we launched last year in February. 
um, and really, you know, started as that kind of online only presence with the website and everything. But that gave us a good foundation going forward. We had plans for events, uh, but having launched on the uh, doorstep of the pandemic and the lockdowns and what have you, uh, we had to put all that on that on. We had to put all that on ice until we were ready to get back out into the real world again. So, yeah, there we go. And then we've got a question for any of the writers who would like to chip in, which is how do you prepare your work before you submit it anywhere? Obviously, when you write something for yourself, you're not necessarily thinking about the audience, but how do you prepare it before you submit it to either Pushing Out the Boat or Leopard Arts? Would anyone like to volunteer? Tom? I can, I can volunteer for that. Um... I find it's always really helpful to read anything that you're going to send to anything out loud um, because uh, you pick up any kind of inconsistency or any kind of error best when um, it's something that you're you're looking at yourself. If you um, edit non-verbally, then your eyes can kind of glan like glance over the... Um, the text without really kind of focusing on every word and taking it all in. So I think if if there is like, if you want like the one weird trick that uh, people won't tell you about, then that's um, that's that's it for me anyway. Oh, I think Mark has. Uh, have you got a hand up, Mark? If you want to pop in and give some message. Yeah, I, just to just to. I absolutely agree with. I, in a former life, I, I was kind of an academic, and that was kind of one of the things about always saying to, to 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 students to kind of read their work and aloud, so you can actually you can hear stuff that you don't see. So, I absolutely echo Tom's point. I mean, a, a couple of other things. I personally wouldn't ever submit anything that I hadn't taken out and got some feedback on, and probably workshopped. I think you know. You, you you need some kind of uh, second sight, third sight uh, on your work. And then other obvious things would be like, you know, use a kind of a plain font and well spaced and a decent size and simple stuff like that. I think always, always helps. Oh, now they're all chipping in. So very quickly, <laughs> uh, Gabrielle has said, Put it in a drawer for a couple of weeks and then read it out loud. And also ask yourself, does it move me? And then, Marka, you have your hand up. Would you? Yeah, I, I'd say yes, by all means. Put it away, have another look. And put it away again and have another look. So don't rush to submit it if you, if you can avoid that. And the other thing is don't give it to somebody who will never enjoy that particular poem or that story in their whole lifetime. So choose who you give it to as well. But try and make every word earn its keep. And sometimes you just can't see that first off, second off, third off. I, I'm not saying treat it like an Ikea sofa to beat it into submission, but really look at every little bit and take your time. Thanks, Mark. I really like that, having every word earn its keep. It's very nice. Right, Will, you've got your hand up. You can go next. Yeah, I do. I think I just wanted to sort of um, uh, add to Marcus' point that I really like that. Yeah, definitely put everything, you know, away and then get it back out again. People are saying this, people are saying read it out loud to yourself. But I think to sort of like offer a, a different, because, okay, yeah, I'm co-editor of Leopard Arts. I've never published on Leopard Arts, but I have had things published in other things before um, and many years ago now. Um, but uh, the... But the, the, the point that Marco made there about um, never give it to someone who's never going to enjoy it. Um, I would also I'd, I'd caveat that with never give it to someone who's always going to enjoy everything that you read anyway, i.e. a close friend or your mom or your sister or someone who's always going to say, yeah, well done. Yeah, I really like that, because I think that sometimes it's good to have. A sort of a, a more critical perspective from someone who's going to be honest with you um, and going to tell you, actually, I don't like this bit. I think you should take that out. I think you should maybe put something like this in. Um, and sometimes that sort of uh, less personal approach actually can help out quite a lot. Be careful who you send it to. Don't just send it to anybody. But yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's a, a good point as well. 
one other point um, that I would say to any aspiring submitters out there, either uh, to pushing out the boats or to Leopard Arts or to anyone really um, out there, is that make sure you know that your work you've got it and you formatted it properly before, like you send it off. Like so many times, as uh, as uh, managing submissions for Leopard Arts, do we get? Um, uh, poetry that's just kind of like sent through in an email or something like that and it's messy and it's difficult to kind of like publish anywhere uh get it in a get it in a document put it out um so, you know send it as an attachment and uh you'll make the editor's life uh, a lot easier and uh they'll probably be uh more willing to look at your work a bit favorably as a result i think so uh, yeah a little bit of insider information there okay cheers And then, Mark, you've popped on your camera. Have you have you got a? Any, oh, you've, you're on mute, Mark. That was just to see people's reactions, actually, because I wanted to see because we we had people up, and I just wanted to see uh, how people were reacting to what Will said. All of which uh, I, I, I I I would endorse. Getting the getting critical feedback is quite is is something that's really quite I found quite difficult. So you have to really kind of go out and, 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 and seek that. And, and also I kind of do a bit of research beforehand about the places you want to submit to. Are they, are they publishing things that you like to read? Cause you know, they're more likely to, to you know, take your stuff if it, if it fits. That's a good suggestion. Um, Gabrielle's hand is up. Would you like the next, here we go. Hi, thanks Kirsty. Um... I think um, submitting is um, it's really easy actually. Um, it's getting rejections, which is hard. So I think where every time a submission is made, you're opening yourself up to the vulnerability of the wound of, of a rejection. So although preparing for a submission is really important, actually I think um, preparing for rejection properly is more important. So the question to ask yourself is, when this is rejected, how am I gonna be kind to myself? What self-care have I got in place to look after myself when this does not go where I want it to go, which will be the large majority of times. And that sense of self-compassion and self-care is, by far the greatest thing that any writer needs to learn and to take really seriously, to know when it is the time to rest and recover, but not quit and to take care of yourself and to recognize that really very, very good work goes unrewarded. And sometimes really very mediocre work can go far and to accept that. And sometimes your work does not deserve rejection and to build in really careful, looking after yourself, um, things to do. Seriously, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, a quick comment from Nicola in the comments, um, in the chat, saying that she's benefited from being part of a group uh, there are some excellent writers with different strengths. In Mern's writers, there are folk who are particularly good on rhythm, but there are also some pedantic souls who spot plot flaws. Spot plot flaws. Um, it's difficult to say. Um, Marka, you've got your hand up as well. Yes, uh, being prepared for rejection is extremely important. Um, and I would just say in, in the uh, classic words of the singer, Alaya, Dust yourself off and try again. Don't give up. Absolutely. Uh, I'm glad that that encouraged such a, such a conversation from all of our writers. Um, so another question for the writers is, everyone well practiced? Do you get to perform live often? And how do you prepare for that? Again, who would like to chip in? Hi. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry, Marco. Do you want to go first, and then we'll 
Sorry, very quickly. Um, just as you've looked at your uh, stories and read them out loud many, many, many times, that is exactly how you prepare for your performance. And if you can, reproduce how you'll be doing your performance. So if you're, practice, if you're going to be performing sitting down, then practice it sitting down. If you're going to be standing at a mic, uh, such as the evening that Leopard Arts had at uh, the Blue Lamp, then stand and practice delivering what you're going to do and try to think about where you're going to pause. And so if you've got scripts in front of you, write them up, mark them up so that you know when you're going to pause, you know when you're going to change the tone of your voice because you want to make your presentation, your reading as interesting as possible with as much variety and color so that your work shines exactly as you want it to shine and the audience really understands what you want to say, but lots and lots of practice. Thank you. And then E. Yeah, I think it's important to just, um, like tonight, my computer crashed just before I was about to speak tonight. So there are some things you cannot prepare for, um, but I would just echo what was said before me there is absolutely, you have to you have to sit and you have to read and reread and reread your, your poetry before you actually speak it aloud in front of other people so that you have got that into your head. Um, and yes, I would absolutely agree with Mark there. I have um, notations all over my poems to highlight the words that I'm going to express. I, I think for me, um, one of the things I really enjoy when I listen to other people reading is when they don't speak too fast. I think um, people who are reading their own work have a tendency to rush it if they're a little bit less experienced. Um, so it's about also um, a lot, a lot can be said in the pauses between sentences or in the pauses between phrases. So, so use the silence to take a breath and, and read slowly and clearly. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, if you'd like to add to that. Yeah, just I absolutely agree with uh, everything that's just been said um, uh, before, but just a couple of other kind of really obvious things. If you're going along and it's an open mic slot and you're going along, have some have some idea of what you're going to read in beforehand. It's really it's really irritating if somebody stands there and, oh, I'll just have a look and maybe I'll do this one. You know, you've only got maybe five minutes, three minutes. You should have in mind uh, what what poems you want to want to read. And I guess that, and that's the other thing is just, you know, have some pay some attention to the time that you've been given. I think it's kind of really um, it's disrespectful, actually, to 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 just roll on and have the host having to come and, you know, say you know, can you wind up because then you're squeezing other people's time and that's that's not really fair so yeah choose your material in advance try and stick to the time you've been given thank you and then will i think if you'd have the final the final say on this i don't know about final say i don't think anything that i could ever come out with it would be definitive by any stretch of the uh by any stretch of the imagination but i think just one thing that i learned a little bit in terms of my own kind of performances and the content the different content i've performed over the over the years is that even coming back you know further back out into the creative process and the performing process and what mark was talking about there i think if you're looking at stuff that you want to perform you've got this piece you really love it you've written it you poured your heart into it be sure it's something that actually would work well as a performance i think i i've certainly had it where i've written you know a, you know a few pieces and there might be one poem for instance that only really could work well as a performance piece um there was one that i wrote which had a sort of whole kind of breakdown and i did a kind of stuart lee robin williams going into the audience and went on the mad rant um and that when you look at it on paper is just that the, you know the, the 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 verse just goes into a bit of prose and it's like well what is that about of course on stage it becomes a whole different beast uh, and it means different things similarly i've written prose which 
you know, is quite wordy or was doing strange things in terms of how um, how text was laid out on the page or how uh, different people were introduced in terms of speaking. I, I you know, transferred um, speaking, you know, in standard prose, blah, 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 he said, to it being more like a script and it was like the name and then the colon and then what they were saying. And I've tried to perform that before and it does work, yeah. But it doesn't work. It, the, the nuances or what I wanted to get out of that piece didn't work as well on stage as what it would have done on the, on the page. And so it's 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 a good kind of well, it's a good thing to have a look at what you're writing, have a look at what you want to perform. Is this something that would work on stage? Is it not? Um, and make that decision first because just as kind of uh, Mark was saying, you know, maybe it's not the sort of the fairest thing to be flicking through a book before you go up. At the same time, you know, you want to make yourself look good. You want to make your, your own work look good and shine it in its best light, um, is what I would say. So, yeah. Thank you, Will. And that takes us right up to nine o'clock, which is our scheduled end. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we we scheduled for a little Q&A at the end. And I'm so glad that we managed to hear from our writers about the process, because I'm sure there are many people in the audience who are writers themselves or interested in the process behind these pieces. Um, I hopped in there, I wasn't meant to, uh, before the Q&A when we had a technical difficulty, um, but I'm Kirsty. I am working on the Wayward Festival, that's who I am before I showed my face. Um, but we have a long list of thank yous for tonight. Of course, thank you to the Leopard Arts team, and the Pushing Out the Boat team, uh, for bringing us these wonderful writers. Thank you to the wonderful writers for agreeing to share their work with you all tonight. Thank you to the University of Aberdeen and to Creative Scotland for funding the festival. Um, it continues up until Sunday night with a whole host more events. So if you want to catch any of those, head to waywardfestival.com. Thank you to the media services and events teams at the University of Aberdeen for supporting um, us and helping us make the actual festival happen. And of course, thank you to the wonderful Leslie Crear, our BSL signer, um, who helps us to make the festival as accessible as possible. Um, I think I have thanked everyone. Let me th check my thank you list. Oh, and thank you to the backstage crew. Thank you to Sarah, who is also here helping to moderate um, and look after and all the tech behind the scenes as well. Um, so yes, thanks everyone for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.